With this little audio visual presentation, I'd like to bring things full circle back to the Arrow Debrew framework that we talked about at the beginning of term. The Arrow Debrew framework was originally developed as an extension to microeconomic theory, extending micro theory to incorporate the key elements of risk and uncertainty, which are important in many settings. But today, the Arrow Debrew theory serves, among other things, as a theory of asset pricing, an alternative to the more traditional theories that we've talked about in this course, the capital asset pricing model and arbitrage pricing theory, but as an essential alternative in that of these three asset pricing models, only the Arrow Debrew theory is really suitable for pricing options. The capital asset pricing model, like we discuss, rests on a set of assumptions, one of which is that asset returns are normally distributed. That assumption about normally distributed asset returns works well as an approximation for individual stocks and portfolios of stocks, but does not hold as an approximation for options. Arbitrage pricing theory moves us away from the need to make specific assumptions about the distribution of individual asset returns. On the other hand, arbitrage pricing theory works to price only diversified portfolios of assets and not individual assets, either individual stocks or options on individual stocks. So of these three, three theories, the Arrow Debrew theory and the Arrow Debrew theory alone uh, forms the basis uh, of an option pricing formula and by going back to the basics of our debrew theory as we will, we'll be able to drive for ourselves the key implications of one of the most famous option pricing models of all, namely the Black-Scholes option pricing formula. So here's a little outline that will help guide us uh, through this discussion. I'm going to begin just with a quick overview of some of the issues that we talked about at the beginning of term concerning the Arrow Debrew framework, what it's all about, who invented it, when, and why. And then we will uh, go back to and extend some of the examples of the kind we worked through at the beginning of term, where we went back and forth between the prices of the fictitious assets, contingent claims that Arrow and Debrew introduced into their framework and that form a, a key component of Arrow Debrew theory, and the prices of so called complex securities like stocks and bonds that are actually traded in financial markets in the United States economy today. So we'll once again see how this can happen, how can you can use contingent claim prices to make inferences about the prices at which stocks and bonds ought to trade, and conversely, how you can use the information in prices of complex securities to make inferences about what the prices of contingent claims would be if those contingent claims actually did trade in U.S. financial markets today. Even before we get to the Black-Scholes formula, we'll extend these examples to highlight the key role that options and option prices can play within the Arrow Debrew framework. We'll see how the information contained in option pricing prices uh, are particularly useful for making inferences about contingent claims prices and how we can use the information in option prices in particular to really enrich and make much more realistic the examples that we were considering before and that we'll consider again moving well beyond the simple toy examples where there are only two states, a good state and a bad state, looking ahead from today to the end of the investment horizon. And then finally, as promised, we'll conclude by seeing how the Black-Scholes option pricing formula works. What we'll see is that while the Black-Scholes formula does not uh, need or does not rely directly on Arrow Debrew theory for its conclusions. The line of reasoning that leads you to the Black Scholes formula is very similar to the line of reasoning that underlies Arrow Debrew theory, so that today all of these ideas are recognized as being very closely related.
So going back to the issues that we talked about at the beginning of term, remember that arrow de Brew theory was originally developed in the late 1950s and early 1960s by the two Nobel Prize winning economists who gave the theory their uh, names. The arrow uh, de Brew framework, Gerard de Brew and Kenneth Arrow. A couple of the key references are listed down at the bottom of this slide. Gerard de Brew's famous book, Theory of Value, is freely available on the internet thanks to Yale University. If you do a Google search, you can find a full PDF copy free of charge. Kenneth Arrow wrote a series of papers developing the framework. One of the most famous is the one listed at the bottom of uh, this slide. This paper in particular is one in which Arrow emphasizes how uh, these contingent claims within the Arrow de Brew framework are related to the uh, prices of assets that we do see, like stocks and bonds, actually traded in the US financial system and begins to give us an idea of how we can go back and forth between contingent claim prices and the prices of assets like stocks and bonds that really do trade in the US financial system today. Like we also talked about at the beginning of term, Arrow de Brew pricing works as a no arbitrage theory of asset pricing in the sense that it takes certain prices as given and makes inferences about the prices at which other securities can trade given the prices of those initial assets. So unlike the capital asset pricing model, which is an equilibrium model, is a theory that allows us to determine the right prices for securities market-wide or economy-wide, the Arrow de Brew framework takes some prices as given and uses the information and observed prices to uh, draw implications for the prices of other assets. As we also discussed at the beginning of term, for many years after the Arrow de Brew framework was originally developed, it remained unclear as to how important from a practical perspective it could be or how useful from a practical perspective it could be. And the stumbling block concerns these contingent claims, which are entirely fictitious assets. They're an analytic device that is used in the Arrow de Brew framework, but there are no markets for contingent claims in the United States then or today, nor are they market or there are there markets for contingent claims in the uh, other real world financial markets in other countries as well. And so again, the question was, although in theory, the approach works, how useful could it be in practice? For that very reason, for many years, decades after the initial development of the Arrow de Brew theory, uh, financial economists and financial market participants devoted their attention largely to more traditional models like those we've talked about in class so far, modern portfolio theory, the capital asset pricing model, and the APT. And Arrow de Brew, the Arrow de Brew framework, though it was useful in other areas of economics, was not immediately applicable in the area of uh, asset pricing. All of that changed, however, with the publication of two very important papers, the ones listed here in the late 1970s. With these papers, the first by Douglas Breeden and Robert Litzenberger, the second by Rolf Bonds and Merton Miller showed, is how you could use information contained in real world assets, and in particular, information contained in the pricing of options to make inferences about contingent claims prices, and not just in the context of a toy example, a simple example, where there are just two states looking ahead from today to the future, a good state and a bad state. These papers showed how you could use the information embedded into option prices to make inferences uh, about contingent claims prices when you can look ahead to next year, let's say, and see dozens or maybe even hundreds of different scenarios, different states of the world that could possibly uh, emerge or arise between it now and then. With the publication of these papers, this was a breakthrough for the application of Arrow de Brew theory since it showed financial market participants and financial economists exactly how one 
could uh, calculate contingent claim prices for uh, a complex real world economy like the United States. And once you have a full set of contingent claim prices in hand, you can go on to price a wide range of other assets, including options on individual stocks. And so too, this uh, analytic framework could serve as the foundations for option pricing theory as well. So what I'd like to do now, partly just to refresh your memory, but also to serve as the foundations for more elaborate examples that we'll work through later, is to go back to these examples where we go back and forth between the prices of complex securities like stocks and bonds and the prices of contingent claims, and then back again, the prices of contingent claims being used to make inferences about the right prices for more complex securities. At the beginning of term, we discussed the notion of market completeness, which is essential to getting this to work, to be able to go back and forth between contingent claims prices and the prices of more complex securities. So another thing we'll do with these examples is to discuss this notion of market completeness in more detail and see with the help of the examples exactly why it's so important to have complete markets in order to get this theory to uh, be operative to actually work. So in brief, before we get to the technical details, when a financial market uh, participant or more likely a financial economist says that markets are complete, what he or she means is that for each possible state of the world, looking ahead from today to any possible future date, there must exist in effect a market for a contingent claim that pays off one unit of consumption in that particular state of the world at that particular time and zero otherwise. And remember again from our previous conversations, that's what contingent claims are all about. They're particularly simple assets that pay off one dollar or one unit of consumption in a particular state of the world and zero otherwise. And so in microeconomic theory, they serve as an analytically convenient way of describing how individual consumers and individual investors can transfer resources over time and across different states of the world in the future by fine tuning their portfolios to include exactly the right number of contingent claims for each possible future state. Of course, in the real world, we don't see contingent claims being traded in any financial market. These are, in other words, just an analytic device that we can use to go from one set of securities in the real world where we see the prices and another set of real world securities that we wish to price. However, as we also saw at the beginning of term, we can construct synthetic contingent claims as portfolios of more complex assets like stocks and bonds, complex securities being securities that make payoffs like stocks and bonds in more than one state of the world when we look ahead from today to the end of our investment horizon, say one year from now. Typically, however, as we're about to see, doing this, going back and forth between the prices of complex securities and the prices of contingent claims, requires that markets be complete. So to see how this works, let's begin with an example in which markets are complete in the sense that there is a contingent claim being traded for each possible state of the world looking ahead from today on into the future. And we'll use contingent claim prices to price a complex asset. So to do this, let's suppose once more that there are two periods today, we'll call that period t equals zero, and next period t equal one, maybe that's next year. Let's say if we're thinking about an investment horizon of one year. And just to enrich the simple good state, bad state examples that we've considered in the past, let's for now think of there being three possible states of the world, i equals one, two, and three, looking ahead from today on into the future. So maybe a good state and a bad state and a state that's somewhere in between so that we can say financial markets are complete if contingent claims are traded 
a separate contingent claim is traded for each of the three states looking ahead to next year to period t equals one. And again, this is a no arbitrage theory of asset pricing, so we need to start by assuming that some asset prices are given. So for the sake of this example, let's imagine that three contingent claims are traded, one for each possible state of the world, looking ahead to next year, period t equals one, and that we already have in hand the three con contingent claim prices. So Q1 is the price of a claim that pays off $1, let's say, in state one and zero otherwise. It sells for 60 cents today. A contingent claim for state two sells for Q2, 20 cents today. A contingent claim for state two pays off a dollar in state two and zero, otherwise looking ahead to next year. And Q3, the price of a contingent claim for state three, that would be 15 cents. A contingent claim for state three pays off a dollar in state three and zero otherwise next year. And now what we want to do is to use these observations of the contingent claim prices to price a complex security, a complex security being one that pays off positive amounts in more than one state of the world. And just for the sake of having an example, let's imagine that security one, complex security one, pays off, let's say, $3 in state one, $2 in state two, and zero in state three. So by analogy, one way of thinking about arrow de Bru, no arbitrage pricing with contingent claims is to think in terms of what John Cochran, my teacher, calls happy meal economics. We can think about contingent claims as being the more basic components of complex securities. And by analogy, we can think of, say, a hamburger and a small fries and a drink as being components of a happy meal or a value meal. And abstracting from or assuming away marketing considerations, uh, we could say that if we know, let's say, the price of a hamburger is 60 cents, the price of fries is 20 cents, and the price of a, a drink is 15 cents, we should be able to price any happy meal or value meal just by totaling up how many hamburgers are in there, how many fries, how many drinks, total up the cost that gives you the price of the happy meal. Similarly, if we view the complex security as being a portfolio of contingent claims, three claims for state one to replicate the payout of three, from the complex asset received in state one, two contingent claims for state two to replicate the payout of $2 in state two, and no contingent claims for state three because this asset apparently pays off nothing in state three, then we can calculate the price of the complex security. There are three contingent claims for state one, 60 cents times three, two contingent claims for state two, two times 20 cents. So that would be $1.80 plus 40 equals 220. This tells us that no arbitrage across the markets for contingent claims and the complex asset must uh, imply that the price of the complex security is equal to $2.20. Now in the first example, the first complex security, we didn't need the contingent claim for state three because that first complex asset made no payments in state three. But suppose now we consider a second complex asset, security two, that pays off a dollar in state one, a dollar in state two, and a dollar in state three. To price this asset, we can recognize that this particular asset can be replicated, its payouts can be replicated by a portfolio that consists of one contingent claim for state one, that gives us the payout of a dollar in state one, one contingent claim for state two, and one contingent claim for state three. So we're just going to total up the cost of assembling that portfolio. 60 cents for the contingent claim for state one, 20 cents for state two, 15 cents for state three, add them up, you get the price of 95 cents 
That's the price implied by no arbitrage for the second complex security, viewing its payouts as equivalent to the payouts thrown off by the analogous or corresponding portfolio of contingent claim. So to price assets one and two, we do need to know all three contingent claims partly for some extra practice, but also to set the stage for what we're going to do next, though, let's just consider one more complex security, security number three, and suppose for the sake of example that this security has a payoff of two in state one, zero in state two, and two in state three. And by now you can probably guess how this one is going to work. In order to form a portfolio of contingent claims that replicates the payouts on complex asset number three, we need to buy two contingent claims for state one at the price 60 cents a piece. So those two claims cost $1.20. We don't need any claims for state two because the complex asset doesn't make any payments in state two, but it does pay out two in state three. So we're going to need to buy two contingent claims for state three at a cost of 15 cents each. So you've got $1.20 plus 30, 15 times two. That gives you $1.50. $1.50 is therefore the price at which this third asset should be observed to trade. So that first set of three examples shows us how we can go from prices on contingent claims to the prices of complex securities. But now let's turn the problem around. In the real world, contingent claims aren't observed to be traded in any market. Instead, what we see are complex securities like stocks and bonds that make payments in multiple states of the world. Those are what are traded. Can we go from prices and payouts of complex securities to prices on contingent claims? The answer is, under certain conditions, yes. And this is what we're about to see. Suppose we have, uh, as an example, three complex securities trading and just in order to avoid reinventing the wheel let's just take the exact same complex securities that we uh, discussed in our first set of examples we've got security number one which pays out three dollars let's say in state one two dollars in state two zero in state three uh, complex security number two, which pays out one in each of the three states of the world, and then complex security number three that pays out two dollars in state one and two dollars in state three. And let's suppose that we observe the prices on these three complex securities. Security one selling for two dollars and twenty cents, two for ninety cents, three for a dollar fifty. And now let's uh, imagine ourselves forming a portfolio of these complex securities, say W11 units of asset one, W12 units of asset two, and W13 units of asset three, given the payouts that each complex asset makes in each state of the world, and given how many units of each complex security is incorporated into the portfolio, we can figure out what the portfolio as a whole will pay out state by state. That's what's happening down at the bottom of this slide, state one, for example. Each uh, unit of complex asset number one pays out three in state one. Each unit of complex asset two pays off one in state one and each unit of complex asset three pays out $2 in state one. And so the total payout from the portfolio as a whole in state one is three times W11 plus one times W12 plus two times W13. And similarly down below for state two, we get the payout of two from asset one the payout of one from asset two, asset three pays off nothing in state two, and in state three, we get the one from asset two, two dollars from asset three, asset uh, one pays off nothing in state three. 
So now let's use that information about payoffs in order to make this particular portfolio synthesize, so to speak, a contingent claim for state one. A contingent claim for state one, by definition, pays off a dollar in state one and zero otherwise. So down at the bottom of the slide, each of the equations on the left-hand side of each equality measures the payout made by the portfolio of complex assets, and the numbers on the right-hand side of each equality are the targets we want to hit, namely a dollar payout for state one, zero for state two, zero for state three, or more briefly, one could say a dollar in state one and zero otherwise. And so what do we have? We have a system of three equations and three unknowns, the three unknowns being the amounts W11, W12, and W13 of each complex asset to incorporate into our portfolio, and three equations to hit the payoff targets, one in state one and zero otherwise. And we've talked about this before. You've got a system of linear equations that can be solved through elimination or substitution. In this particular case, you can verify that choices of W11 equal to a third, W12 equal to negative two thirds, and W13 equal to one third will give you the payouts that you need. Of course, as often happens to be the case in these no arbitrage arguments, this particular strategy involves taking a short position in asset two. That's how we would interpret the negative value of W12. In practice, you'd borrow two thirds of a unit of complex security to sell it while agreeing to buy it back at the market price at the end of the horizon. But with this combination of complex securities, you can replicate the payouts from a contingent claim for state one. And now, in order to figure out what the price of a contingent claim for state one would be if contingent claims actually traded, we should calculate the cost of assembling this portfolio. Our data from before, there's the table reproduced again up at the top of the slide, tells us that each unit of asset one sells for $2.20. We need to buy one third unit of that asset. We're selling short two thirds units of asset two. Each unit provides us with 95 cents today. So we'll multiply 95 by two thirds, subtract that from the total. We need to purchase one third unit of asset three, which sells for $1.50 per unit. Get out your calculators or do the math in your head. What you find is that the cost of assembling this portfolio is 60 cents. Now notice that 60 cents was the price of a contingent claim for state one from our original set of examples. That's no coincidence. Here we're just going the other way. Before we figured out what the prices of the complex securities should be if we know the prices of the contingent claims, now we're just reversing the process. If we know the payouts and prices of complex securities, we can infer what the right price for a contingent claim would be. Next, let's do the exact same thing, assembling a portfolio of complex assets, but this time around, we're going to use this portfolio to replicate the payouts on a contingent claim for state two. So once again, on this side, we're just reminding ourselves if we assemble a portfolio of complex securities, W21 units of asset one, W22 units of asset two, W23 units of asset three, given the payouts on each complex asset in each state of the world, we know what payouts this particular portfolio will make. And now we wish to equate these payouts to our target, the payouts made by a contingent claim for state two. By definition, a contingent claim for state two pays off $1 in state two and zero otherwise. That gives us the system of equations down at the bottom. Again, on the left-hand side, those are the payouts from a portfolio that consists of W21 units of asset one, W22 units of asset two, W23 units of asset three in each possible state of the world. And then over on the right-hand side, we've got our targets, zero for state one, 
one for state two, zero for state three. Once again, therefore, we've got a system of three linear equations and three unknowns, and you can verify that the solution in this case has W21 equal to zero, meaning that in order to assemble this particular portfolio that replicates the payouts on a contingent claim for state two, we don't need to purchase any units of complex asset number one. Instead, we want to purchase one unit of complex asset number two, and W23 is equal to negative one half, implying that constructing this portfolio entails taking a short position, selling short one half unit of asset complex asset number three. Finally, the last step in the exercise, because no arbitrage would require the cost of this particular portfolio to be the implied price of a contingent claim for state two. Let's compute the cost of assembling the portfolio. We're buying one unit of asset two for 95 cents, but then we're selling short one half unit of asset three. That provides us with 75 cents in return. The cost of assembling the portfolio is 20 cents. And again, it's no coincidence that our inferred price for the claim for state two is the same as the price of a claim for state two that we assumed earlier in our first round of examples here. We're just going in the opposite direction. We're making inferences about the prices of contingent claims given the prices of the complex assets. And finally, you can guess that step three will be assembling a portfolio to replicate the contingent claim for state three. If this portfolio to replicate the claim for state three consists of W31 units of asset one, W3 units of asset two, W33 units of asset three, we can use the information on the payouts on each complex asset to once again assemble three equations describing the payouts that the portfolio as a whole will make in each state of the world looking ahead to period t equal one or next year. And to make sure that this portfolio replicates the payouts made by a contingent claim for state three, we want to set those payouts equal to zero for state one, zero for state two, one for state three, a contingent claim for state three, in other words, makes a payment of one in state three and zero otherwise. Once more, we've got a system of three equations and three unknowns. This time around, the solution has W31 equal to negative one third, meaning that we're selling one third unit of asset one short. W32 is equal to two thirds, so we're gonna to wanna to purchase two thirds units of asset two. W33 equals one sixth, meaning that we're going to want to purchase one sixth unit of complex asset number three. And just like before, the final step involves computing the cost of assembling this portfolio. And if there are not to be arbitrage opportunities in these financial markets, it must be that a claim, a contingent claim for state three, would have to sell for the same price. So each unit of asset one sells for 220, but we're selling one third unit short, minus sign out in front down at the bottom. We're buying two thirds units of asset two at the price of 95 cents per unit. And we're buying one six unit of asset three, uh, which sells for $1.50 per unit. Again, get out a calculator, or do the math in your head. Contingent claim for state three must sell for 15 cents. And again, it's no coincidence that this value for Q3 is the same one that we assumed at the outset. We're simply making inferences about that price this time, given the prices of the complex assets. So these first two sets of examples are illustrative of two much more general results. What Proposition 1 here says is that if markets are complete, that is, if there is a contingent claim traded for every possible state of the world looking ahead from today on into the future, say to next year, then any complex security or cash flow stream can be replicated as a portfolio of contingent claims or to go back by analogy to the happy meal or the value meal, so long as we know the prices of each component item 
the hamburger, the french fries, the small drink, then we can price any happy meal or value meal, no matter how complex, just total up the cost of assembling the happy meal in terms of hamburgers, french fries, and sodas. The same thing is true here. Figure out uh, how many contingent claims for each possible state of the world you need to replicate the complex assets, cash flows, or payments in each state of the world. Calculate the cost of assembling that portfolio of contingent claims, and you have priced the complex asset. Now to work in reverse, as we did in our second set of examples, and make inferences about contingent claims prices by, in effect, constructing synthetic contingent claims as portfolios of complex assets, it's important that we started out with three complex assets, one for each state looking ahead to the future. That's what gave us the system of three equations and three unknowns. If we had fewer complex assets than states of the world, then we would have more equations than we would have had unknowns, and it would have been impossible to solve the system for uh, the portfolios that we were looking for. So more generally, if you've got three states next year, you've got to have three complex assets in order to form portfolios that replicate contingent claims. And if there are n states of the world, where n can be any number as large as you want to be, you need the same number of different complex assets so that when you work through these exercises, you've got the same number of equations as you do unknowns. Now, while that last statement holds true as a rule of thumb, there is one technical possibility, one technical problem that can arise to prevent you from successfully going from the prices of complex securities to the prices of contingent claims as we did in our second set of examples. To see this, suppose that in our second round of examples, the third complex asset, instead of paying off two, in states one and three and zero in state two. Suppose instead that it just paid off two in all three states of the world. A technical problem arises in that case because even though there are three complex assets, buying one unit of asset three, you could go back and check this, would it yield exactly the same payouts as buying two units of asset two asset two being the complex asset that pays off one in all three states of the world looking ahead uh, to a period t equals one a year from now. So in effect, what we have is what a mathematician would call only two linearly independent assets. In our systems, we would have had more equations, that is more states than unknowns, amounts of each assets to buy there'd be a technical problem that would prevent us from making inferences about contingent claim prices. So more generally, the linear independence requirement means that it should not be possible to replicate exactly the payouts from one complex security by putting together some portfolio of the other complex securities. But consider that for our purposes just a, a technical caveat that leads us in the end to the proposition that we're looking for, Proposition 2, which says that if you've got the same number of complex securities as you do states of the world looking ahead to the future, and again the caveat is the complex securities must all have linearly independent payoffs, then it is possible to make inferences about the prices of contingent claims for all states of the world by forming the relevant portfolios of the complex assets and figuring out the costs of doing so, as we did in our second set of examples. And we can say under those conditions, in effect, markets are complete since we can figure out the contingent claim prices for claims corresponding to each possible state of the world looking ahead from today to the end of our investment horizon. And still working in a, a general framework, generalizing from what we learned from the specific examples, 
Once we're able to infer contingent claims prices from the prices of complex securities, we can use no arbitrage arguments to price any other complex security or risky cash flow. PA is the price of our asset. XI is the payment that this asset makes in any particular state of the world, and there could be an arbitrarily large number of states of the world. State I running from one to N, you simply do happy meal economics. You calculate the total value of assembling the portfolio of contingent claims, and then you argue that if there are to be no arbitrage opportunities in financial markets, the portfolio of contingent claims and the price of the complex asset that you're wanting to price, they have to be exactly the same. So this first round of examples and the propositions that follow from this first line of examples shows how perhaps the Aradabru fiction of complete markets and contingent claims may not be so fanciful after all. It's true that we don't see actual markets for contingent claims in the United States today, but we do have many, many complex securities, literally thousands of different stocks and bonds that are traded. And what these examples suggest is that there may be some way of using the information in the stocks and bonds that are traded to draw inferences about what the contingent claims prices would be if there really were markets for our debru contingent claims. And once we make inferences about contingent claim prices, we can price any other asset, viewing it as a portfolio of contingent claims. There's still the practical question, though. These toy examples are interesting, and they do work to highlight the main idea. But we want to take things beyond a case where there are just two or three states looking ahead from today to the end of our investment horizon. We want to allow for rich and realistic examples where there could be dozens or even hundreds of possible states of the world that might emerge looking ahead to next year. And the question is, in practice, how do we do this? What those key papers by Bonds and Miller and by Breeden and Litzenberger show is that the information embedded into stock options turns out to be especially valuable for these purposes. So let's take a short break, and when we come back, we'll see how, through a series of progressively uh, more complex but richer and realistic examples, we can use the information in stock options to make inferences about the prices at which contingent claims would trade in the actual U.S. economy today.